Peter Engdahl, welcome to the podcast, man. So glad to have you here. Hello. Thanks for having me. Where uh, where are you broadcasting from? Are you in Norway or Sweden? Uh, where are you? Where are you right now? Yeah, I'm sitting in my apartment in Trondheim, Norway, right now. It's uh, around three degrees, pitch dark, and uh, soon winter here. And uh, it's been raining since I got here from La Palma, so it's really nice to get uh, back on back to reality. Yeah, I was going to say, it must be a, a shock to the system climate-wise after coming from sunny, beautiful, uh, perpetual summertime in La Palma and then coming back to Scandinavia and uh, as winter is engulfing that part of the world. So how are, yeah, you, feeling, for sure. how are you feeling just a few days removed from another phenomenal victory there on La Palma at Transvolcania? Yeah, the body feels pretty good now actually the legs after the race was of course completely destroyed the last descent in Transocania Ultra Marathon is just crazy it's 2500 meters of descending I don't know what that is in miles but uh, yeah around the 7000 miles of uh, no 7000 feet or something of descending yeah it's even more than that I think it's more like 9000 feet of descending yeah probably it's just horrible and <laughs> that makes uh, the knees and quads pretty destroyed afterwards but energy wise and so on i feel pretty good actually just i would say i'm more tired mentally after a very long season mm. i've been race ready since april pretty much with and done a lot lot of racing in the last couple of months since UTMB week has just been a lot two three great months though but I'm pretty tired yeah for sure well it's a great time to take a rest and we'll talk more about the specific performances at CCC where of course you broke the course record and were victorious and then following that up with another victory at Transvolcania uh, but I think first it'd be great to learn a little bit more about you personally. I know you're Swedish and you come from sort of a Nordic skiing background. Can you give us a little picture of your personal and athletic background and how you made your way into trail running? Yes. So I was born in Falun, in Bolinje, like in the middle of Sweden. My parents were both orienteers and skier. Um, Growing up, it was all about skiing. I did, of course, a lot of different sports like track and field, orienteering, alpine skiing, ice hockey, you name it. I did pretty much everything until I was 16 when I started the ski gymnasium in Åre, where the race of Kjellmarathon goes, like it's the biggest ski resort in Sweden, pretty much. Um, Mm -hmm. I started ski gymnasium there and I was only focusing on Nordic skiing, but it is the, yeah, really beautiful mountains there. And I started to get more and more into running there and to run in the mountains. And running was always for me training for the winter. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, how it started. Either either if it was uh, track and field or cross country, it was always to prepare for the winter. And um, yeah, ski gymnasium was a very good time, uh, but I was uh, sick a lot. I didn't evolve so much as an athlete as I wanted during the first years. I had a lot of problems with my health and just sick all the time. So uh, coming into my last year when I was 18 or 19, I changed a lot in um, my training and um, yeah a lot of things I changed so I, I could stay more healthy uh, and that was the goal and that made me have better progression and more continuity in my training so I evolved a lot as a skier my last year as a junior from not being top uh, 30 in the, my age group to suddenly being top 10 which mm-hmm. was really inspiring so I decided after that, okay, I want to go all in for Nordic skiing and see how I can, how good I can be 
So stopping when I graduated gymnasium, I decided to yeah go full in, and I moved to a mountain station outside of Ore, where I worked a little bit, like once a week for house room and the food. But otherwise, I was just running in the mountains there. And the roller ski, we had our own rail, roller ski track, like uh-huh. in the middle of the mountains. Super cool place, but very isolated. And uh-huh. I got a little bit too isolated up there in the mountains. But it was great for training otherwise. But it was really there where I started to change a little bit towards trail running. And where I also started to follow the sky running series and i got to know emily forsberg a little bit when she came there and yeah just started to run a lot in the mountains as i mm. say for training for skiing but i wanted to become a better endurance athlete i was good in the short distance but i wanted to be bet- better in the 15 or 30 or even 50k distance uh-huh and as a I'm not the biggest guy in the world. I'm like 170 centimeters and 60 kilos. Uh, So I'm not a big sprinter or a good finisher in a ski race. So I knew that my strength has to be in the uphills. So I started to look at how can I become a better uphill skier? So that's when I started to follow Kilian and Marco de Gasperi and all these legends within trail yeah. running to like get inspiration to how to become a better climber. And so I started to follow them and did just a, a lot of vert and make, and that improved my skiing even more, which was very fascinating. Wow. But started to follow in this sport, I also realized this is super cool and I just wanted to do a race. So I did my first uh, international race in Limone Sky Race in 2016 or 15, I think. Mm -hmm. Andre Jungsson took me to a trip there and it was a brutal start, but I just fell in love with it. And I guess, yeah, it's history. I still continue to race in skiing and running a lot for the next couple of years and had great success in both sports. Mm -hmm. But then eventually I feel like one and a half year ago when I joined the Adidas Terex team that I finally decided that trail running is my long-term sport and where I want to put my biggest effort into now. And it's been, uh, it's been great. And uh, um, was that, was that a difficult decision to make emotionally or psychologically when you're trying to determine where you wanted to focus your time and energy to leave skiing behind and focus more on trail running no when it when it uh, actually came pretty naturally when when i wanted to do it because i felt like the effort i put into running became more fun and more exciting than to become a better skier so it would have been hard a couple of years ago to make a decision that's why i pretty much didn't make a decision i think and i didn't want to take it i want really wanted to make it work for both sport and i I hate the the decision making of choosing between one or each sport but suddenly i felt like no now it's time to choose and it was a simple choice to to choose actually now that i'm thinking about it as you said it was a year and a half ago that you sort of made this decision and it coincided with you joining the adidas terex team and over the course of the last couple of years your running performance has certainly gone up a level would you associate your increased focus on your run training and maybe your reduced focus on skiing with this jump up in international performance that you've had at OCC, CCC, Transvolcania, et cetera? I would definitely say the last one and a half year that that result has been a 
uh, direct correlation with me focusing more on the on running for sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I just got that extra focus during the racing and worked on some specific things that I didn't put my effort into before. Before it was more of, yeah, building very strong upper body or specific uh, roller skiing training and so on. But this one, last one and a half year, I've been more looking into my weaknesses as, my, as a runner. Mm. And so that um, naturally gave me pretty quick progression in those areas. Amazing. I think, yeah. Well, I'd love to come back to that in a sec, but before we move off Nordic skiing entirely, I'd love it if you could make an attempt to capture the importance of Nordic skiing in the Scandinavian countries and in the sporting culture uh, from where you're from. And if there's any maybe pieces of lifestyle or anecdotes from training that have carried over from your Nordic skiing career into trail running. Oh yeah. So here in Scandinavia and in Norway, especially we think that Nordic skiing is the biggest sport in the world. It's like we, the, that's the main, main thing there is. And the biggest Nordic skiers here, they are like heroes and everybody is skiing and going out in the skiing areas during the weekend everybody is skiing so that's the biggest thing and if uh, uh, someone would um, ask who is uh, if I would go to the city and ask who uh, Kilian Juni is not many people would would know <laughs> but uh, everybody knows who Peter Nurtug is of course. okay amazing um, yeah yeah and uh, for you, Isabel, uh, did you, if you go to Sweden, did you know, you know, Ultravasan, the, yep. the, yeah, the, it's actually a ski race from the beginning. I don't know if many trail runners knew that, that that's the biggest uh, ski race in the world. Imagine that, and that the Ultravasan is just a side show. Yeah, really? the Vasalopit, right? Is what it's called. Yes, exactly. Explain yes. that. Because I, I, I forget the statistics on it, but there's some ridiculous number of participants, right? Yeah, it's fifteen thousand participants. Fifteen thousand uh, people do a ninety kilometer ski race in Sweden. Yes. And the and the starting area is just uh, I think it's three K or something ridiculously long. And it takes some people that is standing in the back, it takes pretty much four hours to move to the starting line. It's oh just it's God. just insane. So that that's how crazy we are about skiing in this country. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So you're also an industrial design student. I think that's why you live in Norway to attend the university there. Can you talk about that? What type of industrial design are you focused on? And how are you hoping to apply that education? Yeah, so I'm studying is a civil engineering a master in industrial design. I'm focusing on product design right now, but we're learning everything from designing web application or apps or system design. Yeah, it's very broad education and I just absolutely loved it. Um, I lived there for two and a half years now. So I'm in my third year of studies doing 50% this fall because I've traveled so much and I felt like I couldn't keep up with 100%. But the decision of starting my studies so late was because I got um, a little bit long story. I, I, I got blood poisoning in 2018, late 18, and I couldn't train for that whole season. And I didn't... Um, yeah, when you are an athlete and that's the only thing you have and then suddenly I couldn't do it and I kind of lost my identity a little bit like, oh, I don't have anything right now. Sponsors left, uh, kicked out of the national team, etc. It mm-hmm. was a very bad time in my career. So I felt like I needed something else in my life and to meet other people and get more perspective. So uh, I decided that now is the time to start doing something more and I've always been interested in architecture and design and all of that and it was actually a designer at Solomon Serge Chapuis who got me into that product design 
actually. So big credit for him to uh, help me to get to that direction. And um, yeah, since I studied, that has also been a big part of why of the success the last one and a half years also, I think, because I have yeah something more in life than just sport. I love to come back to Norway and go down to school and think about other things than running and to yeah have have something more that's been very valuable for me. Very cool. So is the ultimate goal to apply this education and make outdoor equipment, footwear, apparel, things like that? Uh, that would of course be very cool. I'm working a lot with the designers at Terex right now, and that's I think it's super fun. But we will see what, where I eventually end up. I think transportation is a very interesting subject, and how to solve that, or um, also architecture and system design. So yeah, we will see where I end up. Wow. Very cool. So going back to your progression as an athlete, specifically as a runner, you started in sky running. Like you said, your first race was the Lamoni sky race in Italy. And you've recently had incredible success in sort of the 80K to 100K distance. How do you view your strengths and weaknesses as an athlete? Do you feel that you're more suited to the longer course racing as has been reflected in your results this year? I would not like to think that because I do really le- enjoy shorter races also. I just haven't been that fast, I think, on some of the shorter distances, for instance, in the flat and some of the uphills haven't had that high threshold pace mm. uh, that is necessary for a for a shorter race. So... Um, but I do enjoy like every kind of race, so on. And I have a uh, probably will get some get yeah into that later. But I don't see myself going into to more and more doing long only longer races. I really like verticals, vertical case, and uh, yeah, shorter races also. But I can't. I don't really know why. Well, I have some ideas why I really. Um, why 80k or 100k suited me very well but um yeah cool yeah i mean it's good to hear i mean obviously some people are naturally predisposed to success at certain distances and maybe you are for the longer distance racing but there's still a lot of value in testing yourself and competing over the shorter courses as well and uh i think it's good to use those opportunities to sharpen up and develop skills and then, you know, tee up a race like CCC and end up breaking the course record. The first time I remember seeing you on the scene, Petter, was at the 2019 Transvolcania, where you were hard off the front early, ultimately sort of faded, but still had a very strong podium performance, third place behind Thibaut Garibier and Dmitry Michev, two fantastic athletes in the sport. I know that was your first ultra marathon. What did you learn from that experience at Transvolcania as we begin to move towards talking about this year's race? Yes, that was a that was a hard race. I remember, and going back, it was my first longer ultra, and I was super nervous, but also very excited to finally step up in that distance. I had done some longer races before that previous summer. I did Trofeo Kima, which is a little bit over six and a half hours. So I was used to being out for that long time, but the distance of 75K was completely new for me. Trofeo Kima is just very slow and technical, so that's why it takes a long time. But yeah, I just probably felt in too good shape for my own best going into that race. And going back also, when I competing nordic skiing i'm mainly racing for 45 minutes or two hours maximum is the 20 if the 50k distance so i'm used to doing very short races and where it's just over you don't even take drinks during yeah so doing a ultra race for the first time 
I was just going flat out because that's what I usually do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I took it as a race from the start and not like having uh, the first couple of Ks, you know, as a warm up, as uh, you later learn to to do you don't waste energy in the start you try to get into the race but i was just flat out for the beginning get getting a good position and just try to and then suddenly i had a gap after just one and a half k or something and i and i was like oh this this will be fun and then i think i remember getting up to six or eight minutes after l pillar around 35k Yep. But then I actually got bored. I got really bored. I just wanted to finish or take up my phone and call someone because I just I was used to be finished by then, and to so, and to have a couple of more hours of racing was just oh, this is so hard. I don't know if I ever will do this again. And uh, yeah, I think I lost a lot of minutes just because I was slowing down and not being focused, and then. I managed to get some more energy drink and focus. Now I've learned a lot to stay focused during all of those hours and be more strategic with the decision with the decision of uh, taking gels and um, solids or yeah the nutrition, but also the race strategy stuff and just not uh, going by feeling or going max from the start and see how long it goes. Because that was what I usually was doing in Nordic skiing. Then you go yeah. just follow the group or the peloton, as we say, because it's much easier to ski in the peloton and then you drop off uh-huh. Yeah, later in the race, if you do. But um, uh, So I have vague memories from those last 20 Ks. <laughs> I remember falling somewhere in the long descent and hitting my knee which swelled up to a melon after the race. It was not very pleasant. And uh, also, yeah, just being completely destroyed the last days after. But also remember the joy and the relief and emotions after that race that I never really felt before. It was just an amazing feeling. And even though I had... uh, thoughts of I will never do an ultra again I pretty much put on my, the, those thoughts aside immediately when I crossed the finish line I was like I really want to come back and do this race again yeah it was uh, it is a great feeling I think and then after the race I also learned a lot about myself and about the body uh, like how much impact it actually has to do uh, this kind of this kind of effort Mm -hmm. so it was not only the learnings during Transocania that I took with me but also the aftermatch of it very cool very cool I love that you got bored and it was almost like the challenge was more so staying mentally engaged for you over the long course rather than the physical challenge of it so as we move to talking about races that you've done more recently before we get there i'd love to just talk a little bit about your training and ask you to characterize it if you could i had a look at your strava and it seems like you take a fairly moderate approach to volume but it seems like you spend some time on the track obviously you still spend time on skis so can you just give us a glimpse into your training philosophy and specifically if there's anything that you've changed in the last year and a half or two years that you think has contributed to your incredible run of success? Yeah. First of all, I am, I come from a background of much more volume than I have right now, because when I do a lot of skiing or roller skiing, there's less impact on the legs, just like cycling. You can do a lot more hours than you can if you're only running. So I'm used to having over 1100 hours per year. That was my normal training volume when I was 23, 24 years old. So, um, but it was around 50% 
skiing or roller skiing during the summer per se and then 50 percent running so i ended up just having around 60 k's or yeah 50 miles per, roughly per week mm-hmm. but then and then the rest like 15 hours of per week of roller skiing um which gave me a lot of volume then and that i think that i still that base has helped me now i think to have that volume in the bag per se and not not having to do it but it always always helps i think now when i move more over to running and when i started to become more of a runner per se and look and uh, having more sessions on like i say on the track or the treadmill or in the mountains it has a lot more impact on the legs and i wasn't used to that in the beginning so last year it was pretty moderate i still did a lot of roller skiing in the summer not not a lot but much less than i much less than i did before but still a moderate um, volume so i had maybe average 100k a week during last summer and some roller skiing so it was a little bit less volume in time overall but for sure much more distance in running which has another impact on the body so i was really taking that into consideration when making my new plan as a runner because um, i and i don't longer look at the um, the training of volume in time it's both a mix of between the distance and the vertical gain and the time so it's mm. just like you have to put all those factors in consideration of how it impacts your body mm-hmm. and um, so going into this year i um took that into consideration and knowing that i i can't do 25 plus or 30 hours per week like i did before so mm-hmm. and i can't either do and i i, I do felt like my legs can't handle doing 250k per week yep. but and uh, still having interval sessions where i feel good and uh, uh, feeling fast and where i can have yeah progression in my speed because that is something in my background i have based a lot of on my training on into our training and having uh, sessions um, two to three times per week mm-hmm. in uh, so and i still wanted to keep that to not doing yes so drastic things so the the volume training is uh, when I plan my training is always around those key sessions okay. per se and uh, maybe something that I do specifically that is a little bit different is that I do like double threshold sessions maybe um, two times two days per week double threshold session during one day for it's not being super new is something that they use in meaning you do, field and you use two separate workouts on a single day exactly mm-hmm. so that is something i had uh, experimenting a lot with the last two years and that is a uh, yeah training uh, that is quite common here in uh, Trondheim and uh, have also t- done it uh, a lot previously but uh, it's um yeah, so looking at something as Strava is maybe hard to get the full picture, I think. But I think something that you can take it from it is that, uh, um, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, continuity is king. I uh-huh. think it's, uh, and that is something uh, I try to go after. Awesome. Awesome. It makes me want to ask, of course, you, you're living in Norway, your neighbors, so to speak, with Jonathan Albin, Killian Jornet, I know uh, Eric Sebastian, uh, 
is Skullberg, I think is his last name, is living near there. You mentioned Emily Forsberg being an early inspiration for you as you're transitioning towards running a little bit more. Is there anything specific you've learned from being around those athletes that you think has helped you as you know, whether it applies to training or race execution or just being a professional athlete? Yes, I for sure learned a lot from, yeah, especially Killian and uh, John. I think mm-hmm. John in particular, I met him actually the first time I raced Transylvania. We shared a room there and I, we immediately clicked and just been, uh, we just chat, chatted training all day. It was uh, really, really fun. I remember and then, yeah, we've been meeting up pretty regularly since then to do some training together and yeah whenever we train together or meet we um yeah change ideas about training and he has the think i definitely have been i have been uh, inspired definitely been inspired of what he is doing and i learned a lot from him when it comes to executing the um, the sessions not in particular the interval sessions that I more think I learned from other Nordic skiers like Hedrick Tenset or Andre Musgrave from the UK when I moved here to Trondheim say before when I lived in Sweden the philosophy there is that uh, interval sessions should be always super hard and you should feel tired after and you should just get 15 millimole in lactate after each session. That's the best. That's how you get good. But in Norway, they have a very different philosophy that you, they have much more threshold and that uh, you should have a progression in the interval session and that you should finish faster than you started it. But also the team thing that you, we go, when I do intervals with Diedrich or um, and we go, out and do the intervals together and not per se race each other. That's a really important thing that I took from them that uh, interval training sh- should never be a race or uh, a competition. And um, so that I really learned from them, but from John and Killian, it has probably more been the long runs or the long days in the mountains or specific endurance or progressive uh, training mm-hmm. that um, that have uh, really inspired me like for instance doing uh, four hours in uh, like zone two in a long uphill and then taking it quite steady in the downhill and then pushing a little bit more in the uphill mm-hmm. uh, or uh, just going out for a tank going slow in the beginning and just have a finish with a bit of a stride in the in the end uh, mm-hmm. just just some key key sessions like that to uh, to like spice up the volume training or besides the just in the interval sessions to have like yeah something more in the in the training yeah that's fantastic and as a younger athlete yourself, I'm sure it's quite valuable to, yeah, learn from people like Killian, who of course has been in the sport forever and is a wealth of knowledge, Jonathan Albin, who's a little bit older than you and who maybe has a little bit more experience, but who you guys certainly compete against. And speaking of which I'd love to, before we move to this year's performances, have you talk a little bit about OCC last year, because I felt like that was a pretty big breakthrough for you finishing third place at that stage at UTMB week behind Jonathan Albin and Robbie Simpson, two fantastic athletes. What did uh, that performance contribute to your career? How did it impact the way that you viewed yourself and your potential to be competitive on the world's biggest stage? I think what it mostly gave me was the confidence that I have what it takes and or more that I still have what it takes because 2018 was also a very good uh, season for me I finished second in the Skyrunning World Series and Mm -hmm. that's the time where I first raced against Kilian and 
yeah, that was a fantastic year. But then some really tough years after that, where I felt like my body was not going in the right direction. I struggled with overtraining and anxiety, and yeah, just very tough periods. I tough years where I didn't get any progression. So get so getting a good race in OCC and finally recognize my own body and feeling good from the start and finish strong and being most of all being happy during the race Mm -hmm. what's a a big factor uh, I think and I took so much learning from that race uh, about uh, about that yeah like I said my confidence boost just uh, sky skyrocketed Mm. Uh, not visibly visibly probably but for me inside it felt so much so good and I knew that the training I was on the on the right direction per se uh, in training I did change a lot that year like I said uh, dropping in volume a lot from what I had before which made blood values and so another stuff better and I felt more healthy and so on. So there was a lot of factors that OCC finally um, gave me a proof of that I was in the in a good direction, and I was with the team that made me happy. I uh, yeah, the studies and everything. Like yeah, just a uh, just a confirmation that I was finally doing the right things. Great, I guess. Awesome. And uh, yeah, and it seems like so. You did. Sorry to cut you off. I was just going to say, it seems like you've just been building on that momentum ever since through through this year. Yeah, exactly. And uh, also with maybe race pacing and so on, uh, I just, at the time, I just think I nailed it that time. And uh, like Grant's race mentality or like, or more how to go into a race and not being super racy or like competitive in the start of a race like i said i was in Transokania where i just went uh uh, yeah full gas from the start i just uh, took it more relaxed and um chilled in the start in the ucc that time and then was more uh, uh yeah a little bit more um, conservative in my in my pacing that and that yeah it worked fine so then then i just took that with me for the next races cool so So let's let's spend the rest of our time talking about this season specifically ccc transvolcania i read your blog posts after both races so thank you for putting those together always very interesting and you mentioned that you had been in chamonix for four months leading up to ccc it seems like it was an intense focus devoted towards that event. But you also mentioned that you were quite nervous leading up to the race. You just mentioned, you know, dealing with a little anxiety and stuff. And I wondered if there was anything you wanted to talk about there in terms of just like how you handle the nervous energy before races, if that's something that you feel like you've gotten better at in your career and just more or less talking about, you know, as a professional athlete competing on the biggest stage, how you manage the mindset component. I I think that nervosity is uh, generally a good thing when you can handle it. Uh, if the nervosity wasn't there, then, uh, then it means less, I think. So if I'm nervous, for me in a performance, perspective it's very good so Mm -hmm. if i'm nervous then i know that okay i'm going to learn that it disappears when the gun start uh, gun goes so and then you're just totally focused but yeah as i said before before the race i was very very nervous i haven't hadn't done uh, any i say high um, competitive races this year it was mostly the plan was mostly surrounded um, towards CCC and I also I had of course planned to do some other races like Mont Blanc 90 and Miut but 
they were either cancelled or I got sick. Mm-hmm. So I hadn't really tested myself against like the best runners in the world. The only confidence boost I had was from doing uh, a session with John and a long run with Killian, which like, okay, I, I'm I'm probably in very good shape. Uh, but still, it's a UTMB week, and it's normal to be nervous for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, but uh, I think the anxiety and the race nervousness that I more had before was came from more the package of only being an an athlete that my value as a human and what uh, and my happiness or how other people was thinking of me or the per- perception of me was based around my performance yep. and uh, that was something I think I really struggled with uh, before especially in skiing if you, I didn't perform then wh- what was I uh, that was yep. like how I uh, w- was thinking I was thinking more in those lines before when I stood to a start line and uh, uh, a bad result was um, uh, hammering me more down as a person than maybe, yeah, than thinking rationally and uh, so yeah. on. So uh, like I said before, starting school, having a supportive team and friends around me have really changed that. Uh, and so. Um, now this year i think i went into the ccc with more uh nervousness or excitement really yeah. than uh, nervousness of uh what if i fail no it's more like yeah how, how will this be how will i feel in valor scene <laughs> yep, yep. yeah love it man thank you so much for sharing that so speaking about the race execution at CC, CCC, it was so freaking awesome, man, and so impressive. Yeah. And I recall the finish line interviews with yourself and Jonathan Albin, who is your friend and training partner and who finished second place behind you. I think he said that you guys were planning to work together, but you were pushing off the front. We were just talking about OCC where you felt like you'd really nailed the pacing and you weren't too aggressive. So maybe we can continue that conversation as it applies to CCC. How were you thinking about that strategy and were you feeling in control or were you being more of that aggressive style of racer uh, at this year's race? Because you were pretty much in the lead from wire to wire. Yeah, no, I really felt in control during that race. And to be honest, I was actually surprised that John didn't follow. Uh, mm-hmm. So that was my my protection. I, I actually thought that he had uh, dropped when we were in Bar- Refuge de Barton. Mm-hmm. Uh, so because he was so far back and I hadn't heard anything and I felt like the pace was so... Uh, relaxed uh well still uh, i was uh, in the front and pushing it but yeah my heart rate and my my yeah my effort i thought it was quite easy so but um if i put john aside my tactic was to stay in contention and not really letting anyone go or let get, give someone a gap that they can build on uh, per se so i just wanted to yeah control the rest of the field if i felt really good and i and i did so just uh, uh, went run with anybody else not going in a crazy pace or uh, but on the same time not letting anyone aw- get away so that was that was my tactic uh, on until uh, uh, Col de Ferre. And uh, yeah, as you said, me and John had talked before that uh, our tactic was to, yeah, uh, let everybody else get tired until the champion luck, and then we would get each other really tired. I think we still did that, but yeah. uh, because I could, I got uh, um, 
time splits on John from uh, Champelac and onwards. So then he definitely made me more and more tired than I, <laughs> him, I think, more than anybody else. So sure. that plan definitely worked. You both pushed uh, each other to historic performances. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, but uh, before that, I was... Um, I was having a controlled pace and like I said, I was trying to not get in that bored, boredom state. Like I told you in Tazokani, I was just floating and um, going in a comfortable pace where I could feel present and to, uh, to follow my nutrition plan and my pace and my pacing carefully looking uh, that I, didn't go too fast, but when I uh, and when I got the gap up towards Col de Fre, um, I felt like I was very strong in the uphill that day, and especially in hiking, where I could get the gap without putting any extra effort in. And uh, I, until the Champelac, I was always accepting that someone could come behind and join me. That was completely fine for me. I didn't try to keep the gap. I was more like, okay, if someone wants to to catch me, then it must really hurt for them. I will have a solid pace uh, for uh, make it harder for John or for anyone else to catch me. Yeah, and I knew that they will they will have to go very very fast. Yeah, and. Uh, that was uh, John definitely. He did go very very fast uh, from La Folie to Champex. Yeah. Um, so, well, um, but then after Champelac, that was when I was more okay. Now nobody is going to catch me. Now I want to keep this gap or extend it. Yeah, that was the plan. Yeah. Amazing. So I typically don't really ask about nutrition strategies and stuff during races, but you put up an awesome blog post about the nutrition strategy that you employed at CCC, which I'll link to in the show notes for folks who haven't had a chance to read it yet. And so I'd love for you to just kind of describe it. What you wrote was I consumed 120 grams of carbohydrates an hour, eight to nine liters of water, two Red Bulls, one banana, 16 gels, 560 grams of sports mix, and a few gummy bears just for treating myself. <laughs> and you have like a whole table on the web page. Again, I'll link it in the show notes for people to take a look, but you did sort of like a deep analysis on your nutrition. And it seems like you feel that that was a major contributor to this historic performance at CCC. So do you have any comments on that you want to share with the listening audience? Any learnings? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think um, that, that it was work for me and what I found after the re- as I was doing, especially this summer, uh, l- that I needed to consume during a race like this to maintain a speed for a long time. Uh, and the amount of uh, liquids uh, that I also needed to consume. Maybe if you was following the live stream, I was grabbing water from every stream and uh, fountain I could find because I was really aiming for at least get that liter per hour, mm-hmm. uh, which was like minimum anyway. But at the same time, it's a weight also. You don't want to carry one and a half liter of uh, with you all the time. So I was just taking every chance to refill the bottle and to be as light, but uh, have a liquids with me as uh, much as possible and to not have to save on the on the liquids. But then... Maybe maybe the more interesting thing is about the solids. I think I took uh, a banana first time after 25 or 30K mm-hmm. and then a bar towards La Folie. And that was uh, my thought process about that was to have it. That's pretty like soon lunch time. And I feel that after the previous races, I gotten quite hungry or like I feel my stomach needs something solid and not uh, just rely on gels. Mm-hmm. So still, I from previous races, I reduced the number of gels from 
one every 30 minutes to one every 45 minutes. So, and uh, instead adding another bar or solid. Um, so yeah, that was my thought process mm -hmm. leading into the race. And then it was, uh, ended up being um, a good strategy. And as I said in my, it key things for the for my performance in CCC because I never really dropped in in glucose or in like that energy level throughout the whole race. On the I never felt like my muscles was running out of glycogen, which was yeah. uh, pretty pretty cool feeling actually. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing how fast you can run when that's the case, isn't it? Yeah. yeah Speaking exactly. of which, you broke the course record by thirty minutes. You're the only person to run under ten hours on the CCC course. And for those of us who have spent any time on the UTMB or CCC course, we know just how mind boggling your time is. Would you agree that CCC was the best performance of your career and does it change the way that you think about the future of your career? Yeah, I would definitely say that I never felt that good in my life and generally I had I think I had 15 minutes of the whole race after Champelac where I felt a little bit tired or vulnerable mm -hmm. but Either way, it was not a uh, it was not a big down. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I just felt in control and uh, so good the whole way. And uh, uh, if I can have more performances like that, I would be very very happy. I do not expect it. <laughs> I after that, I was like, okay, now every race will feel very yeah. very hard. <laughs> that's that's the downside of having a very very good race. That uh, um uh, yeah Tazakania was it was a very good race but i did not feel as good as uh, yeah. ccc okay but well, um, <laughs> ahead, yeah. but uh, as you say yeah definitely the like ucc last year ccc this year gave me a very big confident boost uh, for sure and uh, uh if it affects the future or my future races we will have to see yeah. Yeah. Well, I think sometimes the challenge is after having one of those magical days to understand that they are precious and rare in our careers and that it doesn't mean that every race is going to be easy thereafter. So let's start moving towards Transvolcania, which you mentioned was another, I mean, it's another victory, but it didn't come quite as easy as CCC did. And again, you wrote a great blog post about your performance on La Palma and in it, you mentioned that the weeks leading up to up to the race were not ideal. You got sick. You generally weren't feeling very confident in your body and in your fitness. Can you just reflect on that briefly for the audience? Just like the time in between CCC and Transvolcania and, and how you, you were feeling physically and mentally before Transvolcania? Yeah, I was quite tired, especially mentally after CCC. It... Uh... It was such an uh, exciting and uh, fun time afterwards uh, with everything that comes around performing very well at the biggest stage. Mm -hmm. And everything. I really appreciate all the messages and all the opportunities that came after that. Uh, and uh, yeah, like I said, I got a little bit sick uh, right when I was starting to get back in training after as you see, it took some time to recover, and I was, um, yeah, really careful with the recovery after CCC, both physically and mentally. But the closer and closer to the race, we, uh, to Trasakala came, the more stressed and maybe nervous I got because it was, uh, yeah, I was still not feeling uh, uh, mentally there when I went to La Palma or, or felt like I had done uh, the perfect training block that uh, I had done for CCC, for instance. I've been, I was training good, but I was not in the environment where I felt like I needed to perform my, as my best. Trondheim is a very, very nice place and 
I really love it, but it's not ideal for trail running. It's uh, quite flat and the weather has been horrible. So it's been a lot of sessions on the treadmill. So it was uh, not very inspiring uh, training um, training rounds back here. So training was medium go. Uh, and then I went to La Palma 10 days prior to the race. And it's only when I went there where I felt like I could get proper training in and acclimatize for the heat mm-hmm. a bit so uh, then the question was is this enough time to get in uh, okay shape and I think it was actually I think those uh, 10 days really did a lot to my fitness and uh, mental state going into the race I, me and Abby Hall we had an amazing time on the island checking out the course and uh, uh, training there so that definitely gave a lot to the race and you guys both won i'm actually recording a podcast with abby later today too so i are uh, yeah, oh yeah i'm a huge huge fan of of both you guys but of course you know her being an american and just having a fantastic like you the last couple of years especially since she started focusing more on her professional running career anyway we'll talk more about that with her but it was awesome to see you guys put together a victory in your blog you describe a moment where you lost contact with the leaders and you questioned whether or not you were out of the fight for the victory can you take us into that moment how did you stay focused and eventually catch back up to the lead yes at kilometer 35 roughly in after El Pilar, I, I stopped for a pee break. I was uh, still together with uh, uh, Miguel and uh, the man who was in the, together with me in the lead group uh, and feeling okay, but not. I was always running the first 30K and waiting for the legs to, to get smoother and to feel better. I was having no problems with the stomach or energy wise. It was just the legs were not moving very smooth or not much power in them. So, yeah, I I needed to go and have a pee break. And when I was done, I felt a lot of the energy just run out of me. So I had some rough kilometers there on the flat just to try to relax and to get back to it. Um, and I think actually the the good feeling uh, started to come back when I put out my poles and started to hike because uh, um, the poles can actually like raise your heart rate a little bit and make the system uh, use glycogen a little bit easier again because um, yeah when you start to get t- t- tired your glycogen start to drop down you feel a little bit uh, tired in the eyes and but just by activating some more muscle groups and to get the heart rate going it gave me made it easier to uh, get some liquids in and some gels and then suddenly uh, my legs were starting to move much easier again and uh, yeah the, uh, during that time where I started to thinking now I'm out of the race. It was more that the others, they looked so strong on that flat and they looked uh, like they were moving very, very fast. Mm -hmm. So I was really unsure if uh, I was, would be able to catch them. And uh, the, uh, it's such a competitive sport and you can't, you can't think that uh, everybody's just going to blow blow up because generally there's always some some people who don't blow up and just can keep a very high pace mm-hmm. from the start. But luckily, I was able to uh, accelerate and to move up in speed and intensity and stay more focused towards the highest point of the course. So, uh, and when I suddenly. Um, Catched up with the front guys, the focus and the race mentality came back and then it was just go from there. Awesome. Awesome. So ultimately you won by 30 minutes again, another just dominant victory, even though halfway through you were maybe a little bit 
reluctant to believe that you were going to do it or skeptical in your ability to deliver another victory at the end of the day, it was very convincing. So I wondered if there was any lessons you you take from that, you know, having everything click at CCC and deliver a historic victory and then have it be not as easy, but still a winning performance at Transvolcania. It's maybe a indication that you're still able to perform well when things aren't ideal. Can you talk about that? Any lessons that came as a result? Yeah, I think the lesson of staying calm and um, more focus on the body and uh, the things that you can uh, do yourself or the things that you could prevent. I, I can't do anything of what the others are doing or how they are running or racing when the uh, when the hard part came or where I didn't feel so good the only thing just had to focus on what to do and not stress up about uh, increasing the pace really just let uh, it doesn't help pushing even more if you start to feel tired then the energy would just run out of you even faster so take a deep breath and uh, step back a little bit and then try to solve the problem I think so that was uh, something that I took uh, with me for sure I mean I'm just doing the rudimentary math in my head but you probably gained almost a minute per kilometer over the course of the last 30 k's (laughs) on the field. So another just amazing performance. And it's been so impressive to watch you compete this season. It's been awesome to have you on the podcast. Maybe one last closing question for you, Petter. I'm sure, you know, you're going into off season now, you'll probably spend a lot of time working on your studies and probably spending a lot of time on skis throughout the winter. How are you thinking about your future as an athlete? What does the 2023 season look like for you? Yeah, I started to sketch a little bit on the plan for 2023 and what I want to do. I, I uh, like my main goal for next year will be UTMB, the full race. That is something uh, that uh, I have been, uh, <laughs> that is something I've been. Uh, uh, what they wanted to do for a long time. I, I wanted to do a bit shorter distances first to see do I really want to do longer ultra stuff. And I can say after CCC, yes, I really enjoy it and I would like to try it. It's the, yeah, one of the first races I started to follow. It's, um, yeah, I just want to give it a, give it a go. But, um, uh, I also started, okay, to look, how do I want to train for it? How do I want to prepare for it? And uh, uh, i more leaning towards a Kilian style of approach to do more short races uh, to prepare for it. Mm. I feel and that was a little bit similar to what I did this year. I was did plan to do Ultra Trail uh, Madeira uh, but uh, ended up being sick so I didn't even have that long races before CCC but that gave me instead a lot of volume I didn't have to do a super duper long race and have a long recovery period after and then a build up and so on by having shorter races I realized that I can maintain a much higher volume uh, so and I still really love to do races like Segama and um, Mont Blanc Marathon or um, mm. yeah other shorter races. So uh, that uh, I'm looking into what kind of races to do until UTMB. Mm. But otherwise, I'm still looking to do my um, summer season in Chamonix and have Chamonix as a base. It's the village and the valley I really love and uh, like to spend time in and yeah awesome. so it's a little bit on how it will look so yeah. interesting times 
Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for sharing it. And I'm sure our listening audience will be very excited to hear that you're planning to stand on the start line at UTMB. I think it's the natural progression for you now as a CCC champion and course record holder to step up to the even bigger race there. And I think it's why yeah, definitely. I mean, if, you, if you think about what your teammate Tom Evans did this year before his third place performance at UTMB, I think he only had done sort of two 80 K ish races at trans grand Canaria and Madeira, the two shorter races there, and then left his biggest performance for when it mattered most there on the UTMB course. So I think it's smart for you to do something similar. Yeah, I was, um, but I wouldn't say that like, yeah, stepping up from 100 K to yeah, the 100 mile is like the progression you should do, like only because you have an amazing performance at the 100K distance doesn't mean that, oh, now you have to go to 100, 100 miles. Mm-hmm. I, I still think uh, that it it was, it is just my ambition and my something that I want to try personally. And uh, I have, I really want, also really want to go back and give a new try on OCC, for example, uh, in the future. I don't, yeah. only because, uh, or even CCC, uh, I don't want to go back next year. I feel like I can't really improve on that performance and it wouldn't be the most motivating thing for yeah. me right now. But as to right now, for me, the most motivating thing is to try a longer distance and the UTMB because it's been in the back of my head. But if you still feel like I have things to improve on a hundred K distance, I think it's uh, why should you step up or even the 50 or even at the OCC distance? Uh, yeah. You don't have to go up to uh, the hundred K uh, CCC distance or the hundred miles that that should be like the, the norm or the biggest stage of racing i do i do hope that occ and ccc get the same kind of recognition and uh, uh, prestige as the main race so that uh, younger race runners or uh, runners with a a different kind of skill set feel like they don't have to increase in distance i 100 percent agree i'm so glad that you said that and as only 28 years old, I think, as you are now, you absolutely have the opportunity to go have a fantastic race at UTMB next year and then maybe go back to OCC. And it is most yeah. important to just follow what you're motivated to do and not let the pressure of the media or your sponsors or expectations of the fans dictate your career, but to follow that into yeah, for sure. ambition. Yeah. Well, Petter, man, what an awesome time it's been for me to have a chance to sit down and chat with you. Congratulations on the awesome season that you've had and look forward to seeing what you do in the future. Thank you, Dylan. Appreciate for, yeah, for being with you. Yeah.